very much. Um, and it is a great honor to be standing here today, and I think it's considerably timely. Because this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Jane Goodall Institute and the 26th anniversary of her Roots and Shoots program for environmental education, both of which Andy has invited you to make a donation if you're so inclined. April is Earth Month. Now for me, every month is Earth Month. But in just a few days around the nation, people are going to be marching for science, for peer-reviewed and evidence-based science and science education. I'll be marching on Saturday in Seattle, and I hope that you'll join. Because in these tumultuous times, I believe simply in a quote by John Muir, who said, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. I believe in outdoors and inspiration and conservation, and I believe that young people are the hope to make a difference. So my talk this evening seems a very important way, as Jane would say, to look tomorrow and beyond. But first, let's go back to the beginning, where the roots of following Jane Goodall's footsteps began for me. I was born in a town that translates as Sacred Mountain, and my birth announcement is this beautiful saffron orange color with a John Denver quote that says, and she'll dance in fields of flowers, lending music to her time. I was raised outdoors by parents who taught me to pay attention and look at the magnificence of this planet. So I grew up believing that every moment was an educational opportunity and that one learned by seeing, hearing, and exploring. I was a girl who loved to look under rocks and chase fireflies and pick flowers and swing. I learned to ice skate on the pond across the street from my house with my sister. And family vacations were taken rafting and backpacking and exploring the great places of the wild lands of this nation. So that's me at 19 months old, bright-eyed and curious. And that's Jane Goodall at 18 months old. It's a famous photo of hers. She's holding a stuffed treasured monkey named Jubilee. And one of my favorite stories about young Jane Goodall was when she was about four years old. She was lost for a few hours and nobody could find her. Well, she had climbed into the hen house and was sitting there patiently, quietly, waiting for a chicken to lay an egg. She really wanted to see how that worked. And similarly, when I was about six or seven years old, I captured some tadpoles from that pond across the street from my childhood home, and I brought them back inside. And when the croaking got too loud, my mother insisted that I bring them back to the pond. I just wanted to know how tadpoles became frogs. And like Jane, I was driven by a sense of wonder, driven to figure out how the world worked. And my fondness for inquiry led me to pursue degrees in natural sciences. I was probably 12 when I first learned about Jane Goodall. She was the first naturalist I'd ever heard of, and perhaps the first living woman scientist as well. So I wanted to be like Jane. Any high school friend could tell you that my dream was to be a National Geographic explorer, belly down in the botany, taking pictures of my own discoveries. So I took an elective zoology class in high school, and that meant five years of science in just four years of high school. And then I went on to earn a degree in biology from Berlin College with a minor in chemistry and environmental studies. But it was that degree in biology at Oberlin in a seminar where I really got more in depth about the work of Jane Goodall, and really a deeper appreciation for her work, not just as a scientist, but as a conservationist. Interestingly, during that time, I realized that the Jane Goodall Institute, in its early inclinations, was housed in a nearby town to my childhood home. In Ridgefield, Connecticut, was the, where they were located. And so I called them up and said, I'd like to come take a visit. So I drove through those deciduous forests on the Merritt Parkway up to Ridgefield, Connecticut, and I went to visit the Jane Goodall Institute. When I got there, funny story, Kristen was the office worker in a tiny space the size of my classroom, and she would apologize that nobody else was in the building. So as a way of apology, she handed me some papers, and she said, these really should be under glass. Because she handed me Jane Goodall's original field notes from her time at Gombe National Park. 
I was floored, I got chills. I still do, talking about it. I got to look at these images. I got to read her poems. I got to tell, read her stories of getting malaria for the second and the third and the fourth time. It was a total pinch me moment, right? I was holding Jane Goodall's field journals. Come on like this. And holding those journals was sort of profound to my connection with her as an individual. And I went on to do my master's thesis in science journaling, but unknown to me at the time that I would do that. I've always been a bit creative, trying to come up with unique ways to convince young people that science education is the way to go and to pay attention to the world. So in that creativity, I came to the University of Washington for my junior year abroad to study two things. I came to study alpine and arctic botany because I really loved mountains. And I came to study landscape architecture, hoping to combine some artistic tendencies with my botany degree. And that's when I first met Jane Goodall at Kane Hall. I went into this lecture hall, completely nervous and totally excited and in awe of the woman I had read about for so long. I didn't have pop culture icons as a teen. And instead, Jane was up there on my dorm room walls with the likes of rock climber Lynn Hill. So Jane approached the podium, much like here, as you see, with her signature ponytail pulled back and took a deep breath. And then she greeted students at the University of Washington at Kane Hall with me in the audience with a pant hoot. It's a greeting she does in chimpanzee, and she does it so frequently that it's actually recorded here. And it's so powerful, I want you to experience it. So have a listen to her greeting. My wonderful welcome comes to you from the forests and hills of Gombe National Park in Tanzania. The sound that you would hear if you came, some of you have been, but if you go to Gombe and climb the hills in the morning, the sound of a chimpanzee greeting the day, announcing, here I am, who's out there? <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> she really is that inspirational. And when I close my eyes, I can still feel the vibration she sent through Red Square. And it was that moment that Jane Goodall for me became more than a scientist. It was that moment she became an educator. It was the way she communicated science to the people around her, just like she did for you and me. So in that moment, she really became real and made me realize I could follow in her footsteps. And also at the time, she said that teachers were her heroes. So I decided to become one. And when I began my teaching career at a private school in Shoreline, that's when I really got to meet her. A long time ago. But thanks to a family at the school, I didn't just meet her, as this picture would indicate, but I got to pick her up at the airport, I got to drive her around in my car, and I got to be the escort for her during this time that she was here for a bumper shoot. She was speaking on a panel called Fish and Chimps, really, with Sherman Alexie as one of the uh, literature speakers, kind of making connections between the environment of the Northwest and, and the conservation movement she was so involved with. So I have a funny story to tell about that evening, too. Um, we arrived to hang out with some school children. Um, these are my former students. They're now all in their 30s. Um, and so Jane meets with students often, just like this, on the living room floor of many houses and many communities. She travels 300 days a year. But when we left that evening, I found out that I was boxed in on a hill in Seattle. Classic Seattle move. And there was Jane Goodall in the front seat of my car. So I was white knuckled on the steering wheel and had a death grip on the parking brake. And I was taking another deep breath. And at that moment, she just reached over and touched me on the knee and said, don't worry, dear. That's what bumpers are for. <laughs> bumpers. I mean, it's a story that really sticks with me because I think it's really how Jane Goodall lived her life, collecting bumpers and finding those folks who would support her in her work. She said, if you really want something, and you really should work hard, 
and take advantage of opportunities and never give up, you will find a way. And Jane took advantage of tons of opportunities. She found those bumpers. And as you know, she found a way to become one of the leading scientists of our time. Jane Goodall wanted to study animals. She talks frequently about how her small dog, Rusty, was a companion for her. And her teacher, the first teacher to tell her that animals really had feelings and had emotions. I think Rusty was one of her bumpers. But an even bigger opportunity came for her when she met Dr. Louis Leakey, the famous anthropologist. And he put her on a path to studying chimpanzees in Gombe. Jane trained as a secretary because her mother said he could get a job anywhere. And Jane at the time then was selected by Dr. Louis Leakey to study chimpanzees in Tanzania. And she became known as one of the tri-mates. Tri meaning three, mates meaning friends, but also a play on word for the primates that they studied. On the left, you can see Diane Fossey, the American who studied gorillas and was made famous by Gorillas in the Mist. Jane is in the middle with a green dress. And on the right is the Canadian Barite Galdicus, who studied orangutans in Borneo. Dr. Louis Leakey believes something special about women scientists, and particularly Jane, who is untrained. He believed that they had a unique ability to have patience and curiosity unclamored by trained scientists' eyes, and that they would be the clue to uncovering ideas about early man by comparing them to our near, near closest relatives, the great apes. And I think it's that fact that Jane Goodall was an untrained scientist that gets me most joy about teaching middle school students. They're untrained scientists. They have unbridled enthusiasm for finding out how the world works. And I don't know why I would teach any other grade. Jane's work began with odds that people thought were insurmountable, and yet she persisted. She became a role model for me in recognizing that science was field work, and field work was science. But of course, Jane's not only a scientist. She's been honored for humanitarian work, and since 2002 has been a UN messenger for peace. But mostly what Jane taught me was that you could combine art, poetry, science, humanitarian efforts, community connections, and build a life around that. Too often, people are put into boxes. What do you want to be when you grow up? But at 83 years old, Jane Goodall is all of those things. And she inspired me to follow her footsteps. So I'm lucky that I've gotten to travel to many marvelous places on this planet to find kin in the landscapes and in the plants and the animals. Jane had dreamed of going to Africa as early as eight years old after reading stories of Dr. Doolittle and Tarzan. But following my footsteps, or her footsteps rather, to Africa would take me a while longer, with two important stops along the way that I'd like to share with you tonight. One of them is the Galapagos Islands, where I, as far as I was concerned, this is the hotbed of biology. This was going to the motherland. This was learning about conservation and biodiversity from the great Charles Darwin. And it was my first encounter with animals so close. So this is me photographing a marine iguana. And that's the photograph. Darwin called them imps of darkness, one of the only iguanas that spends time in the water. Again, close to wild animals like I'd never seen before. Sea lions in beautiful landscapes. And I totally geeked out on the learning. Here, I learned from a biologist about the life cycle of the dome tortoise and all the gestational stages from egg to one month old hatchling. They're pretty cool. And I was fascinated to discover adaptations of animals like this land iguana who eat cactus. Can you imagine how tough that tongue has to be? And flamingos, like dancers, 
And of course, I couldn't help to ex be excited about the wordplay between flamingo and flamingo. And the very colorful Sally Lightfoot crab that scuttles on the rocks as the ocean waves were crashing around it. But being in the Galapagos Islands made me think and got a little crabby myself because I was being concerned about the increasing change in climate on this planet. So I traveled north to follow Jane's footsteps in a different pattern, and I want you to see where I went. In 2014, I went as close as I could to the Arctic, heading into the field with students to lead some climate science expeditions in the Canadian Arctic. We are based here at the Red Dot in Churchill, Manitoba, and at Wapos National Park along Hudson Bay. That park, Wapos National Park, is the size of Rhode Island, and I was there with field students. There was only 30 people in the park. 26 of them were part of my party. Hudson Bay is an incredible place to see beluga whales. So we took a boat out onto the bay and got to see them up close. Beluga whales have no dorsal fins because they spend most of their time under the ice. And it's pretty exciting to see them so close. And our base camp was the Northern Studies Center and later a remote field location in that park. And when we were there, we were looking to investigate the correlation or the relationship between the vegetative cover and the permafrost depth to see if it could be a predictive factor in analyzing that information later from the air. In some places, the permafrost was touchable. You could just reach down into that peaty, gooey soil and reach that layer of ice. It's cold. But in some places, it was more than a meter thick, and we had to probe it with special tools. We sampled vegetation in one meter squares and recorded um, our data as part of a projected 10-year study. On that journey, I also got to fly in a helicopter over the tundra, which was a unique experience. And the landscape was stunningly different than anything I'd seen before. It was amazingly flat and very marshland. This is a picture from the air. But we also got to walk on the ground, and every time we did, we were with an armed polar bear guard, always looking for signs of polar bear. And that's when we saw her, this mama bear. And we got to watch her and her cub for almost an hour about 60 meters away. It was extraordinary. I wonder what she's saying to him. And they were resting there in their day bed just on the edge of Hudson Bay. Now while this snow-free zone is not abnormal for summer months, surely you're aware of the connections between polar bears and climate change. So I just couldn't bear it anymore. So I went to see the last snows of Kilimanjaro before they were gone. It was finally time to head to Tanzania. Not only where Jane Goodall's work began, but where I got this opportunity to see snow at the equator. And as I flew in to Tanzania, you could see Kilimanjaro in the clouds on the left and Mount Meru on the right. Arriving in town closer to the mountain itself, you could really see it's extraordinary snows from town. It's an amazingly tall mountain with an incredible vegetation zones along the way, and so the trek I took to the summit was five days that began in an incredible landscape, a misty forest not unlike the Cascades and Olympic Mountains here. Each step I took brought me into a different vegetative landscape with giant senecios plants on the left, and you can see my hiking companion for scale, and a giant lobelia on the right. It was moon-like and arid, and this particular plant has an adaptation where it's very dry, not unlike pearly everlasting or the flowers you might buy at the farmer's market here at Pike Place. The ones that kind of never die. 
and African impatience. This one is a subspecies to the mountain, impatience Kilimanjaro. So after five days of hiking, we arrived at base camp. This is Barafu camp, which means ice in Swahili. And after walking for six hours at dark from midnight to 6 a.m., we reached the crater rim at sunrise. It was the highest altitude I had ever traveled and one of the most difficult walks I had ever taken. And I wept at first light to the snows of Kilimanjaro. These remaining glaciers are extraordinary and spectacular. They are retreating because there is less new snow accumulated each year and the loss of the snow is greater. In the foreground, you can see some dry snow and ice that crunched under our feet as we approached the summit. Here also you can see a melt pool that was refrozen. The summit is 19,341 feet. By comparison, our Mount Rainier is 14,410 feet. And so while this is not a technical climb, it's pretty high up there. And it's a really busy place. It's a frenetic operation of tons of tourists. Take a look at them on the trail. Heading up to the Skyline Ridge at Barafu Camp. And this frenetic operation requires a number of porters to carry gear. Each of them carrying only about 20 kilograms apiece. It was this many staff for our group of five. So, well, it was beautiful and extraordinary to reach the summit of Kilimanjaro. It wasn't without quiet and wasn't without juxtaposition. So I took footsteps closer to Jane by seeking a stop in more western Tanzania for a short safari in the Bora Bora Crater. Safari, by the way, means journey in Swahili from an Arabic word, safar. So I was on my journey following the footsteps of Jane Goodall. Steep crater walls of Nagora Bora Crater contain many animals down below. And I got to look through my lens as a photographer and as a scientist to the beauty below. African elephants very close to our jeep as they cross the road. With incredible wisdom and stories in their eyes. I wonder what he's trying to say. And while I'm not much of a birder, these yellow-billed storks really got me stoked. Plus the famous African hornbill that sat in a thorny acacia tree. And a kingfisher not unlike the ones we have here. But I think my favorite animal of all time is the zebra. Plus I got this close to them at our campsite. The jackals were so well camouflaged, can you see it? and the gazelles, and the wildebeests. And again, I was fascinated as an ecologist by the interactions of them all. I, mean, I had to wonder what was gonna happen. And then I really had to wonder what was gonna happen. <laughs> and then I was really wondering what might happen. And this is the most fierce animal in the Sahara, uh, in Anza Park. But they really look like big cats, because they are. So a lot of those sleeping dogs, I mean, lions lie there and move on further in Western Tanzania, closer to the footsteps of Jane. Tanzania is a large country south of the equator. And if you look at the map, I had been traveling in the Kilimanjaro region up in the upper right, moving towards the plains and 
or on safari, and moving further west across the top of Tanzania to Kigoma, on the banks of Lake Tanganyika. And when I arrived there, I was met by Dr. Collins with an exchange straight out of Dr. Livingston in nearly the same place. I went something like this. Jessica, I presume? Dr. Livingston? I mean, Dr. Collins, I presume? And sure enough, after months of email with the director of Gombe Street Research Center, I got to meet Dr. Anthony Collins. And he led me out in the parking lot to the site of a van that was going to take me across town from the airport to the edge of the lake. So you can imagine that my heart was leaping and dancing with joy and my feet were scurrying in the dirt because I had put my hand on the handle of a Jeep that said this. I had like a rock, this is like real. This is the Gombe Stream Research Center of the Jane Goodall Institute funded by the National Geographic Society. Like I made it. This was super exciting. And you might remember that the other pivotal moment in my time with Jane Goodall was also in a car. So you could think that these were vehicles driving my dreams. From this point on, I was no longer following the footsteps of Jane Goodall. I was walking in them. And then Lake Tanganyika, lapping at night, lulled me to sleep and allowed me to live my dreams. When I woke up in the morning, I met my guide, Edie Klaus. To my surprise, there were only three folks in all of Gombe National Park as tourists, which seemed crazy to me because Jane Goodall was like the most famous person in the world. Surely there would be lots of people arriving at this location. And much to my delight, the policy of the uh, National Park is to put each person with their own guide. So I got to spend two days with Edie Klaus. And here he is calling to the trackers, mostly men in the hills who've been tracking the chimp activity since the morning time. And through this vocalization and also through radios and GPS trackers, they could spot those chimpanzees and lead the tourists right to them. So we moved quietly on the trail. I was taking it all in, looking around me at each tree, looking above on the brush and on the trail. And we heard some rustling above and Edie pointed up. And that's when I got my first glimpse of her. That's when I got the first glimpse of a wild chimpanzee. And I raised my lens to the sky and captured this photograph of Gremlin. She was one of my most famous chimpanzees. It was as if I was meeting Harry Potter. Right? I read so much about her, all these stories and all of the tales that Jane Goodall had spoke of. This was another pinch moment. I was like starstruck, so to speak. And when Gremlin and her entourage left the trees and descended into the forest, we followed fast behind them. You can see her here, she's moving with great speed. And Eddie motioned that we should follow along. And first he said we should stay on trail, but the chimps weren't on the trail. So I asked him, can we follow off trail? And he looked at me quizzically like no one had ever asked him that before. I said, I could do it, let's go. So down we went. Jane spent her time observing patiently and quietly with a simple pair of binoculars. And I spent my time patiently and quietly with the camera. And I want to show you what I saw. This is Gremlin. She's the matriarch of the Casacala group, and the daughter of Melissa, for those of you who have read about her. She's about my age, and I couldn't help but see myself in her, as I imagine Jane did and the gems that she worked with as well. I mean, this pose got me thinking about thinking, about thinking, about art, about the thinker, about our connection with our closest living relatives. And this is Gremlin's family. Three generations sit here. Golden is 17, and her daughter, Glamour, is about four years old and 10 months at the time. And the smallest on Gremlin's back is Grendel, just a year and two months. Glamour was a mobile little youngster at four, moving around and climbing trees. And Glamour had the most wonderful expressions.
I'm sure you've seen these faces in your own children or your students or your friends. The smallest was Gremlin's daughter, Grendel, just a year and two months when I was there. I couldn't help but notice that the playful antics of this chimpanzee were not unlike my niece, who was about the same age at the same time. When Jane was doing her work, she was accused of anthropomorphizing chimpanzees. She was told she did everything wrong by naming them and by giving them feelings and describing them. But thankfully, her mentor, Robert Hines, had suggested that instead of writing that the chimp was jealous or playful, she should instead write that it was as if they behaved like a human child, and these would be those characteristics. And she persisted. Now, those first days, I had pretty open views, but that was not the case for my second day, which got a lot more adventurous. We hung out with a different group of chimpanzees who were much harder to see, but offered a lot of vocalizations. And Edie guided me deep into the forest brush, where I sat with 18-year-old Chema, a shy, lower-ranking chimpanzee, for more than 20 minutes. Can you spot her? And when I emerged from the thicket of vines, I had two spots of blood on my forehead that Edie said, oh my gosh, are you okay? And I wiped them away with a huge smile. I said, yeah, I'm following the footsteps of Jane. So I did. I hiked to the Casacaela waterfall, to Jane's Peak, on footpaths that she cut 40 years ago. It was here she first noticed many observations of the chimpanzees and got to really earn their favor. I was pretty excited. Being there was just a magical moment. And being a science teacher offered me heaps of opportunities like this one. One afternoon, I was reading on the banks of Lake Tanganyika when Dr. Collins walked by and invited me to join him and a grad student, just sorting some bones. He said, come along. <laughs> sure, why not? So I went into the research center lab to join Nassar here on the right, who's a University of Minnesota anthropology graduate student in linguistics. But he was sorting bones for a colleague who needed some samples that specimens returned. So there I was at Gombe Research Center opening a box of treasures with these two. It was a pinch me moment and then a time with Jane Goodall because in that box lay characters I had read so much about and those who had passed away, like Freud, who's here with Jane in this photo. These are famous chimps, and they were in sacks of bones in this box. That afternoon, our task was to sort and determine the left and right ulna and radius for Freud. Even the anthropology student had a difficult time with this, and I was grateful for my time teaching seventh grade biology. So we wrapped them up in toilet paper like little mummies and prepared them for a research expedition. Near that research center, Dr. Collins told me that they keep the people in cages and let the wild animals free. Baboons were in large numbers around the camp and around the lake. They were cute and fierce and sneaky little menaces. This one's with my beach towel. <laughs> All told, I saw nine species of primates on my journey through Tanzania and later Rwanda that I'd never seen before, in addition to the chimps and baboon babies like these. I saw blue monkeys and vervet monkeys and I saw difficult to photograph red tail monkeys, red colobus monkeys, and white colobus monkeys. But I think my favorite was the golden monkeys in Rwanda. You can see their golden fur gives them their name. 
And how close could I get to these? This close. There's one just behind my right knee in the ferns. Can you see it? Wow. Yeah, that close. I thought so too, little monkey. It was here in the bamboo forest of the Virunga Mountains of Rwanda that I also got to trek to the famous mountain gorillas made famous by Diane Fossey, one of those trimates, and again, the one made famous by Gorillas in the Mist. I couldn't help notice a great contrast in the vegetation between the Gombe National Park and the Virunga Mountains of Rwanda. And I think it gave me a clue to the difference of those two women's work. Even when you cut back the vegetation and the Virungas to stand on it, it's sort of a side hill experience, not an even footing at all. You're at risk of coming in contact with these stinging nettles, just like we have here in the North Cascades. Ouch. I was fully covered from head to toe, and still when I put my knee down to take a photograph, you could feel them. My guide for this experience in the Umbano group was with Francois. He had worked with Diane Fossey directly, and he told me much about mountain gorillas. They're a vegetarian species entirely. And one fun fact about them, like the chimpanzees, is that gorillas and chimpanzees don't drink water. They get all the water they need from their vegetation. So Francois showed me how gorillas get their liquid and get their water from the bark of a eucalyptus. And of course, I had to try it out. It's tasty. And Francois brought me closer to gorillas than I ever thought possible. Do you see how close I'm about to get? Like this close to a 700 pound silverback gorilla. They were amazingly docile and calm creatures. Incredibly expressive. Mostly spending their time eating wild celery. And they live in complex family groups, just like most primates, including us. Which, of course, includes the infants. So these mountain gorillas, even the cute ones, are in danger. And I was really lucky to be there, quite grateful. So I need to be a teacher here for just a moment to make a connection between endangered species, wildlife conservation, and travel. And I want to tell you quickly about the threats to biodiversity. Just five, and I hope this hippo mnemonic will stick with you. Habitat loss, an invasive species, Pollution and population and overharvesting are those things that cause all of our environmental issues to be at risk, especially biodiversity. And it was Jane Goodall who taught me that without people who could mitigate those threats, there was nothing. There was no conservation. It had to come from people. So she established Takare which is the Lake Tanganyika Catchment Reforestation and Education Program, which is a community-based conservation effort that has been replicated worldwide. And here in Kigoma at the Jane Goodall Institute in Takare, I arrived the night they received the highest awards and marks from USAID, one of the primary funders. And as an American visiting and volunteering there, I was treated with great respect because of that USAID connection. Jane Goodall believes that the hope for the future is in children. I think that's why I like her so much. And she started talking with children in her living room in a program that's called Roots and Shoots. Because roots creep under the ground and make a firm foundation, and the shoots that are small reach to the light and break through walls. One of the very first Roots and Shoots members when he was in seventh grade was my guide. E.D. Klaus. Talk about full circle. Talk about action. E.D. Klaus had sat with Jane Goodall in the living room of her house in Kigoma and learned about the threats to biodiversity and learned about what he could do. 
So he went on to get a degree in wildlife management and tourism and returned to work for the Tanzanian Parks Association and specifically at Gombe. So I was inspired to take my own actions full circle. And so I worked with the Roots Institute's program in Kagoma and got outfitted with my very own official t-shirt. It was pretty stoked. And I worked with an incredible team on two projects to improve the health of people and the health of the landscape in the spirit of Jane Goodall's initiatives. There was this one day that I planned a hand washing lesson for like 20 active Roots and Shoots members. And I arrived at the school and the headmaster said, oh, great, we'll have the whole school, 900 people, 900 students. That would fill the Eckstein Auditorium here. So while my lesson was in English, I had to consult my notes for key Swahili words and reminded them that rubbing your fingers together and interlacing them was a great way to get rid of all those germs. And while without paper towels, I did my best Taylor Swift impersonation and told them how to shake it off. <laughs> With those Active Roots and Shoots Club members, we took teaching into action and constructed a hand washing station outside of the latrine in a project developed by Project WET. Take a look at how we cut those beams to make sure they would stick into the ground. That's a machete. So we installed the system with a foot pedal. I'm pretty excited to show off the plans. It's pretty simple. You can try it in your own backyard this summer. And you know what else we did? We planted tons and tons of trees. For three days, I worked with a high school group in Kigoma, tending to the soil, watering it in place and then packing soil tubes that would hold our seedlings chatting with these boys the whole time. We stacked them up and we planted the seeds. What do you think of that? Pretty cool. These seedlings, like children, are going to grow. Given time, they can beautify a campus, provide shade, and peaceful environment for which to go to school. It's trees that sustain all of us. All of these forests sustain all of our primates. The forest of Gombe sustain chimps. The forest of the Varongas sustain the gorillas. And healthy forests of the Cascades sustain us. It's fish and chimps all over again. I look up to the trees. And I look up to Jane. And frankly, I look up to each and every one of you. Because you came here tonight because you were curious. You were curious about my journey and curious about your own. It's a big job, being curious. And if you're a kid, I urge you to keep at it. You can't help it. If you're a parent or an aunt or an uncle, cultivate that in your kids, in your nieces and your nephews and support it. Be patient with it. As an adult, I encourage you to find moments and places to just simply be curious, slow down, and pay attention. You don't need to go to Africa. You don't need to go to the Arctic. You don't even need to go to the Galapagos. You can go explore tide pools at Discovery Park. You can step out your front door and watch the cherry blossoms bloom. Find out when the tulips are up this year compared to last. You can see birds migrate here back to Seattle. You can hold on to something and wonder. So why do you think today? Where is your special place? Where's your hen house? Where will you go for a while and get lost? And what footsteps do you want to follow? What difference do you want to make? To me, the golden monkeys looked a lot like the Lorax. I don't know, what do you think? And so with Earth Day on Saturday, I thought it'd be a good time to inspire you to care. 
Because unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So whether in rhymes from Dr. Seuss, or in words from Dr. Goodall herself, where the greatest danger to our future is apathy, I invite you to care and take action and have hope for the future. In parting tonight, I leave you with this quote. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. I know that Jane Goodall has made a difference in this world, and I know that Jane Goodall has made a difference in my life. As an environmental educator and photographer and adventurer, I hope that tonight, in following my journey, in following Jane's journey, and in following her footsteps, you've made a difference in yours. Thank you.